Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees and on each episode I investigate a different, weird and wonderful subject. And on this episode we are going to investigate the case of an Atlantic hopping ghost. A well-dressed ghost who hopped back and forth from Wales to America. And not only that, they were able to do so while carrying people, living, breathing human beings back and forth with them. More specifically in this tale, the female apparition carries a man from Cymru over the waves to Pennsylvania. And I know what you're thinking, it all sounds a little bit far-fetched, but the source of this tale is, we are told, undoubtedly trustworthy. And it was recorded in the 18th century by a man called Edmund Jones. Which is a name that will be familiar to regular listeners by now. And I won't repeat myself again and give you the whole history of Jones. But very quickly, just to get everyone up to speed, he is credited as being the first person to gather a collection of, in inverted commas, real-life ghost stories from Wales together into one book. And whether you choose to believe them or not is entirely up to you. I think either way, they are still wonderful stories. And a key thing which is worth remembering with Jones is that he was a Welsh independent minister. He was a Calvinist, and this fervent Christianity shines through in much of his writing, and much of his tales are gathered from fellow church members and churchgoers, and I think it's worth bearing that in mind when you listen to his tales. Now, the last one we looked at from Jones was uh, a month or two ago, episode 46. That was the tale of the hanged lady and this tale also takes place not too far away from the events of the hanged lady in the parish of astra gunlice which is on the river tawi and is in modern day powers and the local man who wrote down this story for jones so jones could preserve it so i could talk about it centuries later was the reverend mr T.L. No full name, just initials, but the Reverend Mr. T.L. And as mentioned, this is a man of the cloth who has given this story. You would like to think that as a man of the cloth, he is telling nothing but the truth, and it's worth bearing that in mind. Now, to begin at the beginning, this account concerns a young man from the parish who was a son to an innkeeper and he was often troubled by supernatural odd sights odd sights and they were sometimes of light sometimes of darkness and of dark misshapen things in the night for some years and this straight away makes this story quite quite different to a lot of the other ones that we look at because this isn't somebody encountering something for the first time. This is somebody who is well acquainted with strange things going on. Odd sights, dark, misshapen things in the night have been plaguing him for years. And so you could say it was only a matter of time before he bumped into a full-bodied apparition came face to face with well I'll, I'll quote jones for this bit he says at last a spirit appeared to him in the shape of a well-dressed woman whose clothes he described but sadly jones doesn't bother <laughs> recorded for us how he described her but she's attractive and well-dressed and she stood before him in a narrow lane and he did what anyone else in the circumstance might do when you happen to bump into a full-bodied apparition in a narrow lane in Astragunlis. He did all he could to get past her and to get away, as much in fear, we are told, as doubting what she might do, which I think are one and the same, really, aren't they? Being in fear of what she might do. And what she did was 
Nothing, because he was successful in getting past and getting the heck out of there. But this was a narrow lane he had to use regularly. There was no way of avoiding it. And sure enough, a few nights later, as he returned down the same narrow lane, she once again appeared, and this time she was determined not to let him sneak away. And so, with nowhere to escape to, he plucked up his courage, he took heart, and decided to start a conversation and to ask her what she wanted. Why do you keep stopping me in this weird, dark, lonely lane? That's that's me paraphrasing there, not a direct quote. And she bid him not fear. She would do him no hurt, for she had looked often in his face in the space of eight years' time. Now, if that's not going to freak you out, I don't know what is. Don't fear, there's nothing to worry about, but I've been watching you for the last eight years. And presumably, these dark, weird shapes he's been seeing at night have been the same ghost. But she did have a mission for him, a little task, a little favour. Well, quite a big favour, actually, when I read it out to you. But she had a little favour she wanted to ask of this man. She told him he must go to Philadelphia in Pennsylvania and take a box from a house there, which she described. Again, Jones doesn't give us the description frustratingly, but take a box from a house there in which was £200 in half crowns and charged him to meet her again next Friday night. So, now he knew why she was bothering him. He knew what he was supposed to do. And on Friday night, they were going to meet up again, presumably to make some plans on completing this task. Now, this is quite a popular motif, certainly in older ghost stories. And I'm I'm sure it's popped up on this podcast a few times, where these ghosts ask you to do something on their behalf for a reward, or even if there's no reward, just to leave you live in peace again. What is different about this one, of course, is it's such a huge distance apart from Wales to Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania in particular is quite important from a a Welsh perspective because it is one of the parts of America where a lot of Welsh immigrants headed to. And I would love to go into that more right now, but sadly this isn't the the, the the ghosts and geography podcast, the, the ghosts and travel podcast. It is ghosts and folklore, and I, I am determined not to go off on any big tangents on this episode. So, back to the ghost story. And afterwards, this young Astrogunlice boy told some of his neighbours what had happened. Of course, word spread around the area, and he was invited by the curate of the parish, who... In brackets, we are told by Jones is a good man. He was invited by the curate of the parish to visit his house for a prayer meeting on Friday night. Now, if you've been paying attention, just seconds ago, he was told by this well-dressed, attractive ghost that he had to meet her in a narrow lane on Friday night. Instead, he had been summoned to a prayer meeting on the same day date and he of course went to the prayer meeting now this meeting went on until midnight i guess technically one minute past midnight would would make that saturday then wouldn't it we're crossing over into the next day and this young boy was said to have been very uneasy throughout the night and did not definitely did not want to leave the house at the end nevertheless Everyone was going home. Maybe he assumed by after midnight he was a bit safer than he was. And he went outside with the parson's servants to the horses. But as they came back from the stables, the servants noticed that he was gone. To quote, they were greatly amazed, not knowing what to think of it. He had seemingly vanished into thin air, just as they popped to the stables to get the horse. Now, while they might have been confused, we do have some insider information. And to quote once more, we are told that the apparition 
carried him away to a river hard by, threw him into it, and wetted him. Now, I am assuming this is the River Tawi, which runs nearby. It could have been any river. Either way, he was wetted. He was wet as a result. But she did not chide him for telling the people of the appointed meeting or for not coming to meet her according to promise. I'm assuming he must have promised. She bid him not to fear she would not hurt him. Presumably throwing someone into a river doesn't count as hurting. (laughs) Clearly not in the ghost world, at least anyway. He was, as far as she was concerned, in safe hands. Which is very important, considering what happened next. Safe hands really do matter here, because she said, And now we begin the journey. He was lifted up and carried away. He knew not how, without seeing sun and moon in all the journey. So he was whisked off. He had no idea what time of day, what time of night, nothing. All he knew was he was traveling somewhere and When he came to the place, when he came to this destination he was being taken to, he saw light and was carried into a house, again he knew not how, and into a fine room, but saw nobody inside that room. So, while we assume this apparition carried him away, we don't know how exactly, maybe just by using her hands or by some other means. He doesn't know either. All he knows is that he has arrived in some room, a room with no people in, and then he was instructed to lift up a board on the floor, which he did. There he saw the box as described to him earlier, and he took it. And then the spirit said he must go three miles and cast it into the Black Sea. Now, this is black C with lowercase b and lowercase s, as opposed to the black C. And so I am assuming what is meant by this is a C which is black. But the way this this apparition is bouncing around the world, who knows? While events started in Astrogunlice, they have now moved across the Atlantic to Pennsylvania, to Philadelphia. And then he must go three miles and throw this into the sea, which I am assuming is black. But maybe through some magical means, three miles will take him to the Black Sea with capital B and capital S. I don't know. Maybe maybe if there's somebody listening from Philadelphia, they can explain the whole Black Sea situation to me. But anyway, back to this tale. They went to this Black Sea, which as far as he was concerned was some lake of clear water. Might not even be a sea then if anyone in Philadelphia knows of any lakes. And it was there that he was commanded to throw the box into it. And after doing, as he was told, there was such a noise as if all about was going to pieces. It sounded like the world was falling apart. And from thence, we are told, he was taken up, up into the air, I assume, and brought to the place where he was taken up, back to sunny Astra Gunlice. After touching down, he then asked her whether he was free now, and she said yes, he was, and told him some secret thing, and strictly charged him to tell no person. Would he keep his promise this time? Well, I don't know what that secret was, and I am assuming if Jones knew, he would have included it in this tale, so maybe, yes, he learned his lesson and did not tell anyone. But this ordeal had taken its toll. We are told that this probably took three days and three nights. The mysterious journey lasted from Friday night to Monday night. He missed the entire weekend as a result of this in some weird ghostly time, however things work when you're being west across the Atlantic. And his appearance showed the signs of his ordeal. When he came home, he could hardly speak, and his skin was somewhat like leather. He could hardly look in another man's face, 
and looks, we are told, rather sickly. And this was a permanent change, this sickly look, this leathery skin, this inability to look in somebody's eye was a permanent, permanent change because Jones tells us that at the time of writing, he was either still alive or lately was so. As to the apparition who had whisked him away, we do have a little description of how she looked at the end and also a possible hint at her identity and her motive for whisking people from Wales to America. And we are told that she looked pale, her looks severe, and her voice hollow, different from a human voice. And while he was not in great dread while she spoke, he was in great dread beforehand and when she parted from him, it was almost the, the, the anticipation then that filled him with dread, rather than anything which actually came out in that, that hollow voice from this pale face. And afterwards, that dread seemed to have returned, and maybe that is what lingered throughout the remainder of his life. As to her identity... An other local person, a woman in the neighbourhood, sadly no name or more details, but a woman in the neighbourhood remembered lately that about 80 years ago, 80 years before this tale, one Elizabeth Gething went from Astrogunlis to Pennsylvania. Most likely, she believes, it was her spirit which had returned home for assistance and maybe there was some relation, some blood connection to this man. We don't know. And before wrapping things up, Jones does point out that some people might doubt elements of this story because how was a spirit able to carry a man in the air over land and sea about 4,000 miles forward and backward? Of all the parts in the tale you could pick fault at, he does think some people might question that little detail. But as he reminds us, let it be remembered, he says, that an evil spirit carried the body of our saviour in the day that he was suffered to tempt him through the air to Jerusalem and the pinnacle of the temple. And if you want to know where that quote comes from, Jones does handily tell us that it was Matthew 4, 5. And as I mentioned right from the start, this fervent Christianity does creep into everything that Jones writes. And again, he points out that spirits carrying people through the air was not a modern or a contemporary, I guess I should say, contemporary to the 18th century phenomena. This is something that was happening in Jesus's time. So why can't it happen now? And if that doesn't convince you, he does have some other theories, one of which, quite an obvious one really, maybe the spirit had some help. Maybe there was a bunch of them and we just don't know about the others. Or maybe, and th this one is quite a stretch, I'm just going to quote him directly, but unless spirits are not subject to the pressure of the atmosphere as bodies are and therefore inconceivably stronger to carry burdens than if they were subject to the pressure of the air. They haven't got the pressure of the air or, or something or whatever he's on about. I guess if you think about it, if, if a spirit doesn't have to carry their body, but has the strength to to walk around normally, could it, could it? I, actually, I, I said no tangents, so I'm not going to go off on that tangent now. We'll save the air pressure on spirits' bodies for another day. And he also gives an equally convoluted answer as to why this spirit wanted this money destroyed as well. As I mentioned, this is quite a popular motif that crops up again and again. Why not Why not use it for good or why not use it for bad even if, if that's their intention? Why destroy it? Well, simply, he says, my answer is that we know little of the manner of the world of spirits. And there are many instances in the apparitions of spirits of eternity that they were very short in giving account of the other world. 
again, let's not dwell on that one. Let's just say we don't know. Let's just say Jones doesn't know either, but he, he is keen to stress again at the end of the undoubted truthfulness of the Reverend who told him this tale, who certainly believed it himself. And as far as Jones is concerned, to doubt the details, to doubt the evidence, which is so clear to him, to doubt it is effectively to doubt God. And Jones is not having any of that. And for further evidence of Jones's spiritual beliefs and belief in spirits, he does record some wonderful, wonderful tales. As mentioned, the last one I spoke about was on episode 46 about a hanged lady nearby. But I've done about three or four now, and each one refers to the last one. So if you did want to check out episode 46... And that one will direct you to whichever one I did before that. Since reaching the episode 50 milestone, I'm starting to lose track a little bit of what's going on with this, this podcast. I need, I need a holiday, I think. But I will certainly be revisiting Jones again in the future, probably in a, in a couple of months' time. And as always, if you don't want to miss that or any of the other wonderful, wonderful tales coming up, be sure to hit the subscribe button. And as always, if you have any thoughts or any comments, I'm quite easy to track down on social media. All of which just leaves me to say, I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast. It's the best, it's the beautiful, it's the only Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. Thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian am Grando. And until next time, no star.